Our next panel is going to be a very interesting one. How many of you have heard the term transparency used in regards to the music industry? Hey, people actually raised their hands. That's awesome. Um, I'm sure that the actual answer is all of you. Um, how many of you would say you have a clear understanding of what it means in this context? That's probably less of you. Um, if you don't have a perfect answer, you're not alone. And many of our panel may say they don't as well. We'll see. Um, transparency is one of those buzzwords that we hear a lot, but could definitely use some unpacking. And that's what our panelists from various corners of the music business are here to do this afternoon. Spoiler alert, there are a few different definitions that you'll encounter in this discussion. And without giving too much away, I'll just tell you that they are all important to musicians and composers. So I'll turn things over to our moderator, attorney and Northeastern University professor Dave Herlihy, who will guide us through this important topic. So thank, thank you, Dave. You, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we have a really interesting, uh, really qualified and, and diverse panel today. And so um, what I want to just do quickly is sort of run through the description of, uh, of the panel and the idea of transparency, which has become this, this invocation in the music industry. If you say it enough, no one can accuse you of uh, the lack of it. Uh, but what does it actually mean? Uh, musicians often call for transparency in accounting and in royalty distribution. Indie labels want more information about negotiations that they're not a part of. Um, songwriters worry about the lack of transparency in direct deals between publishers uh, and platforms. Uh, music services want transparency about what catalog they can or cannot use. Uh, globally, there are issues around black boxes uh, and unattributed income that never makes its way back to creators. Uh, is there a common definition or a set of principles that could be adopted to advance this goal of transparency? Uh, who makes the call? about what information is made available and how can technology and better data management lessen the burden of music industry middle people um, when keeping them accountable to artists while keeping them accountable to artists. This panel will explore those issues around timely and accurate dissemination with an eye towards a less opaque music industry. So what I want to do to start it off quickly is run through uh, the panel from left to right and have everyone give a uh, less than one minute introduction as to uh, your name, your background, and what transparency means to you. Well, my name is Jeff Boxer. I'm the executive director and general counsel for the Content Creators Coalition, I'm an artist-run organization that looks for economic justice in the digital age. I also teach law school at Loyola Law School, and I used to be a union side labor lawyer, but that's in a former life, and we need not talk about that now. Um, Definition of transparency, well, like military intelligence, it's one of the, in, transparency in the music industry is one of the great oxymorons. Um, I, it, I frankly uh, wouldn't even know how to give you a decent um, definition of it. I know exactly what it's not and what it's not to our members. Um, and what I'm hoping we will talk about on this panel is how we might get a little bit closer to it. But one of the most astonishing things to me uh, about transparency in the music business is how little of it there is and how unacceptable it would be in any other industry. Uh, I'm Jim Griffin. I'm very involved with registry issues as a consultant working for WIPO, the UN, some clients who are very, very interested in this issue. But I would say most importantly, I'm involved with a startup right now uh, that's licensing and going to have to pay. And for me, that's transparency. It's a registry. It's a clear accounting of who owns what and who made what and who was involved with it. I guess I would define it as the inputs and outputs, that we have transparency as to where we need to go to get licenses and who we need to pay once we have those licenses. Uh, my name is Walid Diab. I'm senior counsel uh, at Google. Uh, I work on the, um, the uh, corporate side, which means I, you know, uh, negotiate agreements uh, with music licensors, uh, record labels, and music publishers. Um, and so I'm bringing the perspective of a, of a, of a licensee, of a service provider. Um, I think to me, transparency uh, is like, uh, like uh, Jim and Jeff pointed out, um, you know, the ability to know uh, definitively what you're licensing. So um, on the inbound licensing side, that's you know access to authoritative and comprehensive data about who owns what and where. Uh, and then following that through, uh, you know, data and usage um, sort of finding its way back to the creators so that they can see exactly how their content has been used 
um, and hopefully, you know, sort of follow the dollars through the system uh, and, and, and back into their pockets. Hi, uh, my name is Darius Van Arman. Um, I'm with Secretly Group. Uh, we're an in independent label group that's based in Bloomington, Indiana. And uh, talking about transparency, you know, in the context of the music industry and the independent label specifically, um, you know, I, I see it as like you're, you're making an agreement to release recordings by an artist. You, you tell them, hey, if we can use your recordings, we'll give you this share of the pie. And with that comes an obligation, I think, to, to share what you earn using their music and what deal terms um, are coming into you. And, and if, if you're earning money that's not necessarily attributable to their works, then you figure out a way to either be open about that with the artist or, or figure out a way to share that with the artist. And I think transparency is just being open about deal terms, uh, communicating clearly and comprehensively with the artists what they are, and um, that's pretty much it. I'm Tom Silverman. I'm the founder of Tommy Boy and the New Music Seminar. Um, this is a, a very important conversation right now because technology is uh, demanding transparency. Transparency is uh, really just simply understanding clearly what are the rules and what are the splits uh, in as few words as possible and as easy as to understand as possible. Uh, there's not a right or wrong in transparency. Uh, it's just um, an understanding and a clarity uh, of what people are agreeing to. When people sign deals, I don't think they often understand what they're agreeing to. Uh, there's a word called gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, means hidden. Agnostic means revealed or unhidden. So this business needs to become a more agnostic business. I think everybody in the room agrees on that probably, and uh, I think I'm very looking forward to this discussion of how we put the A in front of Gnostic in the music business. I don't know how to follow that. Um, <laughs> my name is Tanya Carcio. I'm um, an entertainment and intellectual property attorney at Vori Sater, Seymour & Pease here in um, DC. And um, my background is at major labels and major music publishers before I uh, ruined my life and went to law school. Um, and so to me, transparency is a little bit of what everyone has said. It's just that both parties know what they're getting into and have the same access to information to understand what they're doing and um, what they're getting is fair. Um, or, but what they are getting is what they expect not necessarily fair, but what they expect. And so um, it seems like people largely think of transparency as a positive thing. Uh, what are the barriers to it? Why, don't, why doesn't it already exist? So I remember um, getting to meet Morris Levy when I was really young. And, uh, <laughs> and he told me he was very competitive with Walter Yetnikoff, who was the head of uh, CBS, or yeah, I guess it was CBS at the time. And he said, I make more money than that motherfucker, Morris said at that time. And Morris, you know, Roulette Records was a pretty successful uh, record label at the time. And he's famous for this, um, this fight he had with Tommy James' biggest artist back in the 60s, where Tommy James was only getting four points. And at the time, other artists that uh, signed to the, the majors were getting eight or nine points. And Tommy James said, I'm your biggest artist. You have to pay me eight points. He goes, I can't pay you eight points because he understood his economics, but he didn't say it that way, because he's known as a gangster, Morris Levy. And um, he says, but I insist, I have to have eight points. He said, but I can't pay you eight points. Says, but everyone else is getting eight points. I, I want eight points. He goes, all right, I'll give you eight points, but you're only getting paid on four. <laughs> and so, but Morris Levy wasn't being a gangster. Actually, he was being transparent, right? He was telling the truth to this guy, because when... At the same time, the, the rates went to eight points at the majors. They include, included deductions, recoupables, and other things that made it really be four points. Right. Well, there's the, there's the royalty rate and the royalty base, right? Like I was, on, I was on a Sony label, and we had a royalty rate based upon the retail price. So I had 12 points. A friend of mine was on a different major label. He had yeah. 25 points, yeah. and I had by point envy. Yeah. Right? And I didn't realize that, you know, penny rate-wise, it probably equates to the same thing, but there was this sort of... 
um, these numbers, Escalation, so these numbers hanging yeah. in a vacuum. We don't really understand what's going on. And the lawyers on. had to look good also in front of their clients. So, see, I got you eight points. But, you know, they don't care about that. They got their check. And then when it's time for the artist to get paid, they still got paid on four. So Morris Levy really wasn't just a gangster. He was the only one telling the truth. Jim? Yeah. I mean, I think we can all agree we're against theft in any form unless we're the thief. But I, <laughs> I'm going to try to draw a light on the specific problem that I see and that I'm trying to combat. And that is that I want those who use music to report their use of music using globally unique identifiers. Because the lack of globally unique identifiers in the reporting process means that the money falls by the wayside. And the reason that the money falls by the wayside is that the current method of moving money to the creator involves what's called semantic matching. And semantic matching is not fit for a digital age. It is not fit for the year 2014. What it means is, is that when that original report comes, and so let us be very specific here. When Pandora reports on the use of a song, they report with the artist name and the track name and perhaps the album name, but not with a unique identifier. And in the semantic match process, many things fall by the wayside. The artist's name is spelled incorrectly. It is somehow punctuated wrong. Trust me, you don't want to be guns and apostrophe roses in that world. You don't even want to be BGs because there's 24 different ways to express BGs. And unless it's the one that the database matches with, the BGs aren't getting paid for that particular track. None of us thinks this is fit for purpose. It's as if wire transfers between bank accounts happened with names instead of unique bank numbers and accounting numbers. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm going to this level with this is just to draw a microscope down to the complaint. Because if we can get those who use music to report with GUIDs, there will be no excuse for that money to disappear along the trail to the creator. But until we get them to report with the use of GUIDs, it will continue to accrue to the benefits of the majors in each organization. And by this I mean that the direct participants in each PRO tend to split the spoils around the world by market share. Those who are not direct participants, in other words, they have a sub-publishing agreement or they are distributed by someone else, does not see the benefit of that market share distribution arrangement. And so, in a very real way, we need to get to those. Now, I have gone to them, and I have asked, why don't you report with GUIDs? And their answer is clear. We don't have to report with GUIDs. The judge doesn't make us report with GUIDs. And we can't report with GUIDs until there is a publicly accessible, comprehensive database that is authenticated. Now, you might say, that bar is too high. But it's not. I do understand why a reporter, a reporting organization like Pandora would say, give me a very clear, comprehensive, authenticated, publicly accessible database before I use those. It's an understandable uh, suggestion. Our failure to do that accrues to the benefit of those who are direct members, but it does not help small or independent uh, organizations or artists like yours say in Indianapolis because you're probably not a direct member of the board of these PROs and so you don't split in the market share system of oh you have 41 percent of the market so you get 41 percent of the lost money. If you get 41 percent of the lost money and you have 41 percent of the market share or more likely you have 41 percent of the market share and because none of the smaller medium participants are included you're getting 50 or 60 percent of the money then you're not necessarily for fixing this. And by the way, even if you're, you think there might be an argument for fixing it, it's not going to happen with your money. Because why would you pay to do something that doesn't benefit you directly? There are too many externalities. So if, so if these powerful intermediaries are, are, have an interest in this, in this legacy inefficiency, how do, we, how do we fix it? 
who fixes it, how do we pay for it, how does it get done, what's the mechanism by which this GUID comes into being? Well, I, I don't mind just going right to it and saying, if, if you ask anyone in this room how to register a domain name, I suspect every single one of you can not only tell me where and how, but how much it costs you. And if I asked everyone in this room how to register their music around the world, I suspect we get maybe one or two real, honest, correct answers. Isn't there even a star registry where you can register a star in your name? Tommy, that's absolutely <laughs> true. <laughs> it, it's, tr <laughs> it's true. Well, I, I think the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that the ICANN system for registration makes a market in registry services, meaning it's profitable to engage in registration. GoDaddy and others are... You know, KKR bought GoDaddy and now flipped it again. There's money to be made doing it. And so I will say this to you. If we make it profitable to register, not, not for the person registering, but for the system of registration to exist, for a system that engages in outreach and advertising, if that is profitable, then you will see dramatic growth in registration. But I think if I were given the choice between making it mandatory under the law to register and making it profitable to register, I would go with profitable every time because I'm not sure that the law will be enforced, but I do know that if there are proper incentives in the system for outreach, for advertising, for making money, that people will engage in that for profit very reliably. But also incentives for bad behavior then, too. Pardon so me? If, you, if, it, if it's based on, for example, if, you know, take the the domain registration world. You have people who are squatting on you know, websites because it's profitable to do so. Nothing we, wrong with that. Well, some of us think it's counterproductive if it's like you know, your personal name that's being squatted on or something like that, and that person is just looking to sort of build the system for, for its own gain with a purpose that has nothing to do with the domain system. But you know, to, to maybe talk, you know, to, to go back to you know, what we're talking about with, with opacity and, and transparency and what is in the way uh, of transparency and, and what what entities would be interested in there not being transparency. I think it's it's those who just don't want to have uncomfortable conversations. You know, if you are a large corporation and you're getting some advantage systemic because you can game some sort of registration system, um, or you know maybe you can achieve a deal that others can't, and you want to keep the fruit of that deal to yourself and not share it with with people you're contracted with who who are providing you content, then I think they are motivated to, to, to not be transparent because it really reduces their bottom line. You know, just to, uh, to follow up on both these points, I think that it's, um, if, if you have a self-interest in mind or what you perceive as your self-interest, like making quarterly profits or ex exacting a better advance for some direct deal versus a, like to Jim's point, facilitating the marketplace, something that's more ecosystem oriented. I mean, if the air is breathable for everybody, then everyone's going to be a lot healthier. But if you have a private home with pumped in fresh air for yourself, you'll be fine, but sort of, you know, fuck everybody else. And so I think if there is this notion of committing to a, a whatever fair is marketplace, but a transparent marketplace, if we could all agree as music industry participants that nurturing the marketplace is something that's worthwhile, we could be smarter about the deals we strike. And, and I agree with you, Jim, that you know, a, a bedrock of, of transparency would be that there is some global database for repertoire. And you know, we can argue in you know, a separate conversation whether that should be public or private, but I think that's fundamental. To I'm, look, I'm fine if there's public ones, private ones, there's lots of them, all competing, fine. I, I think that actually is a more robust system than pretending that we've got it. And I mean, there's nothing worse than pretending that the copyright system today somehow enumerates and records rights, because it simply does not. I mean, in fact, it does the opposite. It tends to reassure those who have not registered that their rights are somehow unimpaired, you know, which is a, a complete falsehood. But surely you're not saying that that's the limit of transparency. You know, you have uh, co-writers 50-50, one half is BMI and one half is ASCAP. They have a big hit on the same song. One gets a different check than the other. So clearly there's not transparency. There's, you know, the definition of what it earns is not clear. To jump in here real quickly, and I promise not to engage in semantics. Um, <laughs> I'm willing to go Please along do. with you. For most of, most of you, you probably realized what Jim was talking about. Um, for the rest of you, even though we're just before Halloween, the shock of recognition must have just sort of gotten you right in the middle of the chest. Um, what he's basically saying is the basic fundamental reporting structure necessary in order to track the money does not exist. 
Um, we're talking about a failure of transparency all the way from creation side through distribution from top to bottom. So before, you know, yes, absolutely, who's benefiting from the lack of transparency? Um, all those kinds of things. But what I think needs to get across here is that we are literally talking at every step of the chain that what is needed, the infrastructure that is needed in order to make this market work, you know, in a, in a way that's more transparent, does not, in point of fact, exist and needs to be created. There are models. Um, there are ways of doing this. There, it needs to happen. I mean, it's, if this, if music is going to flourish in this country and elsewhere, um, it is a matter of absolute necessity. But it is truly stunning when you realize exactly how screwed up it is. And, and it, it, I mean, it's almost in certain ways beyond belief and, and beyond compare in the United States that there is, I cannot think of another market to compare it to. Um, By the way, it's not just the United States. Yes. It's around the world. But let me go a step further and point out that I've had a number of conversations with people at major music companies because I've been involved with registry efforts. And often they say in this kind of exasperated manner, Jim, what would you have us put into this registry for people? And you know, I would say, well, look, maybe we could start with the date and place of fixation. The date that it was born and where it was born. Oh, no, we would never put that in there, Jim. If someone knew the date and place of fixation, they could learn very quickly that at some point it goes public domain and they don't have to pay for it. And that would be a very clear indication that they could stop paying on that certain date. And so you say, okay, well, look. I mean, maybe you would put the splits in there because Tommy's right. You know, you need to know the splits in publishing in order to get a clearance of the rights for publishing. By the way, some of the lawyers in the audience may say, oh no, Jim, you don't need to know the splits. You could go to any of them and get them to represent the others. Yes, only if they agree to represent the others in joint tenancy, and they never do, because that's just a tradition amongst them. Yes, and not in all countries. So then you say, well, what about the splits? And they say, well, the splits are the last thing we want in the database, is somebody to find their way, to work their way around us to those who have these rights. And so I think even when you hear this you know, sort of yeah. complacent, okay, yeah, we're for registries, they would make it more efficient if they happen, somebody else has to pay for them, but we'd go along. When you investigate very, very carefully what others think of as registries, you begin to realize they don't have the same idea of a registry in mind that we do. So if you're a creator, what does this mean for you? What this means for you that means no matter how well you educate yourself right now, you do not fundamentally have the ability to have the information that you need to make in completely informed decisions. Granted, so stipulated that life is an incomplete information problem. This is the most severe version of the incomplete information problem you're going to find. As creators, you must get to the point where you say that this is intolerable. There are so many creators that I have met that do not want to admit that they don't understand their deal, that they don't understand what they're getting, they don't understand why they're not getting it. They want, they don't, everyone wants to show up at the gym in good shape, right? You know, nobody wants to be the guy, you know, who's like, wow, I'm really glad I came back after Thanksgiving. Everybody wants to be there ready. Well, the bottom line is none of us are ready. You know, none of us are ready. You may know something about the fundamentals of the market, you may know something about the history of the deals, but all of them suffer to a greater or lesser degree from, a, um, from being incredibly opaque. And you could have a great label like some of the people that are sitting on this panel that are doing their damnedest to let you know that stuff, and even they don't know. So there's only so much they can tell you. It is necessary, it, this, is, this is your pitchforks moment. You know, where it's like, wow, we really can't, if we can't know and we have to know, what do we need to do to get there? Well, there's, there's, you know, in every kind of a deal, whether it's, you know, from, from the inception of a deal down to the implementation of a deal, down to the obligations of accounting, you have this kind of people playing their cards close to the vest. And I don't want to give you the information. I hope your lawyer is not as smart as my lawyer so I can fake you out and, and, and get a better deal for myself. And uh, the wording in this is, uh, gotcha. You didn't read this properly. Gotcha. And that's kind of what, a, and then a lawyer comes back with the pelt you know, from the deal, I got the pelt, and I, you know, I got the kill for our side. There isn't this, there is this inherent competitive um, advantage that's buttressed by intellectual property, trade secrets, and there's a, there's a, they value in proprietary information. Whenever you ask any service provider, what are the terms, how do you get paid, they all squirm. Like, you know, like they're sitting on a hot seat, when you ever at a panel, you ask, so what do you guys charge the artists? Nobody wants to just say what the deal is, because everyone's always kind of really uncomfortable disclosing their, uh, you know, their bit of the, of the pie. So let's start with the distinction between public and private. Let's say that you can have reporting and disclosure requirements that do not necessarily have the name 
um, of the parties on it, but that you have industry-wide reporting so you can see the high end, the low end, the median, so you can run your regressions. So you know what's going on out there so we can start getting into this and then maybe match that up to, with what Jim's talking about and have some kind of modicum of information that we actually can rely upon besides that which is strictly proprietary. Um, anyways, just a thought. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what's, what's tricky about, you know, I'm not going to apologize for the lack of transparency in the music industry, but what's tricky about making the music industry transparent is that the deals are not commodities. They're, they're all very unique and specific to, to artists and, 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 and what they're doing and, and what genre they're in and what, what kind of label is, is signing that artist and um, you know what their distribution is like and what rights there are, whether it's publishing, master side, mix, how they cross collateralize and, and all sorts of nuances which make it very hard to just say, hey, this is the universal royalty rate that we're, we're paying an artist. It's it, that's why they have these you know agreements. Some companies that are many many pages long, and I think you can talk about transparency in the public context. You know, and you're, you, then you're talking about something that's maybe closer to you know royalty rates that are getting established by statute or, or something like that. Um, and you, you can even talk about a marketplace where you know things become absolutely open to all, and then really the biggest companies and the smallest companies are on a level playing field. Um, and maybe we'll get there one day, but the, maybe the step we need to take now is to sort of encourage good behavior within the industry where you know, the stakeholders, whether they're small companies or big companies, um, are following good practices where they are being transparent about the deal terms with, with who they're contracting with to get content with the artists. Um, if, 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 an, if a label enters a deal and gets a big lump sum payment of $100,000 but only recoups 50000 of that uh, from, from actual streaming that occurs in the marketplace, then that label is committed to sharing that excess $50,000 with its artists in some equitable way. Maybe they prorate it based on what was streamed to, to earn the first $50,000. And you know, speaking as an independent label, one thing that we have done as the independent community is we put forward this, um, this win uh, fair digital deals declaration, which was a commitment that a lot of independent labels volunteered in making and that, that basically said, hey, we're going to make our terms of our agreements you know, comprehensible, easy to understand. We're gonna be transparent with you. And if we do get equity stakes or big guarantees or lump sum payments that aren't necessarily attributable to specific recordings, we're going to figure out a way to, to share that with you in a fair way. Yeah, I, I got to say, I, I'm with you on that, no question, but I think that's a little more like nailing jelly to a tree. Was the deal fair? What were the points, et cetera? I, I just want to communicate how very fundamental and basic what I'm talking about is. This industry assigns a code to every sound recording if you do it right. You go and you get an ISRC number for your sound recording. And if you have a song, you get an ISWC code. And if you are an individual who wrote a song or performs a song or recorded a song, you want to have what's called an ISNI code, an ISNI. And these three codes that apply to the song, the sound recording, and the people who are involved are a three-legged stool upon which identification management depends in the music business. And we do not have publicly accessible databases of the ISRC codes, the ISWC codes, or the ISNI codes. That's how basic this is. So with respect, I, I agree with you, the deal points, you know, mm -hmm. who knows where that goes. I just don't want to confuse the notion that we literally do not have databases of the numbers we've been handing out for more than 20 years. But even if we did, we'd still have this issue of no, lack we of transparency. Wouldn't. We wouldn't yeah, no, we would. Because I can, I can tell you, I can give you an example right now of what's happening in the marketplace. There are some large distributors, large companies, who are reassigning ISRC numbers to recordings that already have them and then making it hard to audit. Happens all the time, because sure. if you buy a catalog, you think, I want to make sure they all have a code, I'll get a new code. Sure, but the registry by itself isn't going to fix the oh, transparency Oh, it's a issue. necessary but not sufficient Same condition conditions. for success. Of course, I agree with yeah. you on that. But I just want to drive home how very simple this is, that quite literally we have agencies that charge money. 
ISRC agency charges money to get an ISRC code. But they do not keep a database of the ISRC codes they hand out. To the barricades. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and the same thing is true of ISWC. I mean, yeah. it's almost bizarre, right? I mean, you don't believe it almost. No, no, I, 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 and just to, to take Jim's uh, thought one, one step further, I think, I mean, we can sort of argue and we can debate about what terms um, are proprietary, what, you know, components of deals are proprietary and how businesses are structured, but at a minimum, ownership information, which is what those three codes um, really get at, to me, that, that shouldn't be proprietary. That should be available to anybody. You should be able to know definitively what you're licensing. Um, and I think beginning to chip away at that and beginning to fix that problem will address some of the other issues that you raised. For example, you know, this concept of breakage and deals not necessarily being tied to the value that, that, that's being licensed. I mean, that's something that hurts the industry as a whole. It hurts us as distributors, for example, because it drives down your margins. You end up paying for content that you don't need. Um, and that, you know, ultimately, deprives creators of the value that they're entitled to because there's less money to go around. So I think, I mean, we can sort of argue about what pieces of, you know, the way people run their business should be proprietary and protected, um, but I think at a minimum, that sort of ownership, that basic ownership information, um, we should find a way to make that available to everybody. It strikes me, too, Jim, you would say that, that when you talk about the attributes of a database, that some parties are like, oh, no, not that, like, not the data fixation. Because they're primarily concerned about, as you say, when this goes into the public domain, it's like if, if that level of, of sort of misguided self-interest kind of taints the process to begin with, how do you even get to the point where people are going to realize there's a larger value in this? There, there is a, there's, well, granted, okay, you know, life plus 70 or 95 years, and isn't that long enough? Yeah. Shouldn't, I'll, I'll shouldn't you be fine? I think. But what I learned is that we should not rely upon owners of intellectual property to register it. We should rely upon the creators of intellectual property to register it. They, I mean, if you just took it as a basic motive, does a creator have a motive to crow about their work? The answer is yes. We know this is a fact. This is how they behave. Do owners of intellectual property tend to crow about what they own and the data about it? No, they prefer to control very, very carefully that information. So let us not rely upon those who own it for registration. For example, do, is it the Hollywood studios that register movies on IMDb? No. It's the creators who register things on IMDb, the actors themselves, the teamsters who drive the trucks, the people who work on the catering on the set. They all register their involvement on IMDb because they want to. They pay $15 a month for the right to register their resume, their works. Uh, any effort to register the works of creators must start with creators and not those who aggregate their work downstream. You know, but, you know, practically speaking, in, in the marketplace, I, I agree with you that, you know, creators should be encouraged to register, but often they don't. And where would they? And, I mean, and, and they're, and they're, and they're, would you call the copyright office and register? No, they won't take your registration, and yet they should because you have a you section actually, 114 no, you, right to that money from Sound Exchange. Which, which copyright are we talking about? I, I'm saying, for example, if Pandora uses a song and it does not have an accurate identifier on it, and that money flows through the system and falls into a black box along the way, which happens to all too much of that money. Sure. That's a problem. The bass player doesn't get paid under that circumstance. Sure. They should have taken a registration. Wait, wait, wait. Which, wait, which right are we talking about? Are we talking about the, the recording copyright? Are we talking yeah. about the performance copyright? copyright. Either yeah. one. Well, performance copyrights can be the song or the sound recording. Right. I so, mean, but, so it doesn't but, but, matter. But, but, I mean, there's different rules for these different rights for different reasons. There are, but we don't use GUIDs in either case. And my point is, Okay, so the black box benefits some and not others. Let us not turn to those who benefit from the black box to expect them to extinguish it. I think we all, except the biggest companies, hate the black box. No, they love it. No, except for the no. biggest You're companies. You're agreeing. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we agree. <laughs> um, but in practice, yeah. in practice, like we're an independent label group. Right. We work with a lot of artists. Right. Most of them even though they know how to, even though they're empowered to, even though they have copyrights before they come to us to work with us to release them, even though they clearly know how to register their copyrights, they don't. And you know, if you talk to some PROs as well, they'll, they'll talk openly about this problem where when dealing with data, it is, it's, it's more 
reliable to get data from labels and from artists, generally speaking, an issue that I think the artist community is working really hard at, at rectifying. So yeah, maybe you know, in, in an ideal world, you know, creators and artists are, are, are you know, very active and very on the ball with regards to, to registering their copyrights and, and, and creating the good metadata. But in practice, it's not happening. I think it needs to be a, a partnership between the creators and those who release the music by the creators. I'd have either of them. Fine. But or I, maybe a requirement. Yeah. Even, I, I happen to agree with Jim, but I also don't believe that if we had, if every created work had a GUID and there was a publicly available database that was easily uh, accessible to anyone, it would not eliminate the problems of opacity. Uh, there still would be transparency issues everywhere. If I had a 50-page contract with an artist and that artist signed that, that artist wouldn't know what the hell they were signing. And when they got their royalty statement, they would have no way of questioning whether it was right or not because it would just be confusion. Why do institu institutions continuously hide behind shields of opacity, you know, is the question I keep asking myself. Why are they so against uh, transparency? Yeah, and, and I think it's because institutions always put their mission second to their self-preservation. And I'm talking about all kinds of inst institutions. Georgetown, the Catholic Church, any institution, you name it, once it's established, self-preservation becomes number one ahead of rebirth or whatever it, its, uh, its uh, mission statement supposedly is. And institutions benefit from opacity because the expertise of institutions is to decipher the code, which only they have the key since they created it. But Tommy, you know, <laughs> so it's an issue of institutionalism. So right. I agree that you know, and so so for the entire independent community to sign on to a manifesto saying we agree to pay artists fairly and share digital royalties and revenues of any kind, whether they're attributable or not attributable fairly, is a massive step by the independent community to answer the issue of transparency. And, uh, and, and I like to give Darius a lot of credit, along with Allison Wenham and Wynn, they've worked on this for a long time. This is a real step toward transparency that's happened in the last year, so thank you, Darius, and everybody should give Darius a big round of applause for the work he's done on this. I just, I want we should to, challenge yeah. all of the other institutions to step in line and do the same I thing. Think, I really like what Tommy said, and I think this sort of reminds me of the, you know, the classic innovator's dilemma, right? We're asking somebody to disrupt something, and we're looking to the big major labels of the large players that have huge market share to do something that would ultimately perhaps be in their self-interest, but they can't recognize that because it's such a big change. And so in the last panel about metadata, we had a, a quick discussion about the idea of some kind of a pull-down menu in each production environment, like say Pro Tools or Ableton, or if, if each production environment had a pull-down menu that had all the information, check the box that you wanted to have, and then you could go to a server, and that server would, would give it a, a GUID. So then, rather than ask the majors or the big companies to do this, just provide a you know, in-production environment system that would work, that would begin to, for the newbies, the independents, create a database that would actually be robust and be transparent that then follow-on companies could use and say, okay, if the majors don't want to get involved in this, let, let it come from the grassroots by smaller companies that can do this and then let it sort of, uh, as a proof of concept, begin to work in the marketplace and then, and then the majors say, wow, we actually want to begin adopting that because this has come from a, a smaller place to begin with. I just think relying upon the majors to do this thing that would ultimately be in their best interest is right. just not going to happen. Because opacity is a cost center for everybody. It costs labels, it costs artists, it means, it's, except for lawyers and accountants who thrive based on it, but for, the, but for the actual core creators and those investors and creators, opacity is a cost, not a benefit. Let me observe really quickly, Tommy, that you're right about the record deal when you say, oh, he won't even know what he signed and that won't be an opaque deal. But you sit on the board of Sound Exchange, which is a great organization, and the money that comes from Sound Exchange doesn't depend on that deal. So Sound Exchange is seeing a dollar come through the system and they take 4% off the top, which is the best administrative rate in the world. Yep. And they split that money 50, 45, 5 between the sound recording company, the featured artists, and the unions. And that money goes to those featured artists without recoup. 
So there's no playing around with the money. If you get the data straight, the money really does flow right. in a and more... It's a transparent in, in institution. A, right. It's unbelievable. It, but that's it's an my, anomaly in this world. Is that sales are going down where you get screwed, but the service side is going up, and their sound exchange comes into play, and it routes around that if only we can build correct database, yeah. databases, accurate databases. Last year, I was here on roughly this same panel, and the sound exchange representative said, we have eight million tracks in our database. And I was impressed, because that's as big as I've seen from many places, but think about it. The iTunes store has over 60 million tracks. So eight million is a drop in the bucket on the way. And there were others on the panel. That was the largest one on the panel. We had a number of services. One of them said, I think, uh, oh, I forget who it was, 1.5 million in their database. The unions, after an AF of M, said that they had 800,000 tracks in their database to split 5% of a billion dollars. Now, I just say to you that there's money there that can go to people if that money can be properly matched. But absent an accurate match, we're not going to see it. Well, and we're talking about different problems here as well. I mean, the bottom line is the ability to figure the numbers out requires the kind of tracking that Jim's talking about, the ability to read a contract, to understand what's in it, to take some ownership of that uh, and be on both sides of it is equally as important. Um, and, you know, and clearly we're talking about an industry that has a lot of impediments, far more than we've brought up here today, um, you know, to that not happening. So. If you want to stop being defeated, you have a pretty good idea where to start. I was going to bring up another um, underlying barrier that um, goes to this data issue as well, is that um, there's this whole underlying disincentive. Um, you were talking about incentivizing people to do the right thing. The whole problem is there's also this underlying legal system that we have that's over 30 years old that doesn't understand any of these problems. So another way to get at this as well, that we need all these pieces, is also going to the legal aspect and going, um, trying to change how that all works. Because until we have something that's up, date, um, up to date and people understand, there's no way that we can make all of this work, even examples. if we have a database. What would be an example? Um, you were talking about the, um, the claimant of a copyright. Um, yes, the claimant of a copyright is the person who creates it and fixes it. But then you have all these deals to transfer to a publisher, a, a record label. So having it at that base level, you still have a little bit of issue because that writer doesn't necessarily, well, I gave my rights away. I really don't know what I can do. So you still have those other layers um, and also for the the publishers and the record companies, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. And they don't want to give that information. That's sort of a, the, the law is sort of that underlying layer that impedes this as well. And there's also ambiguity about whether recordings are work for hire or exactly. you know, owned by, by the artists. To and explain I think that yeah. issue, if, none of, uh, if you are unaware, is in the Copyright Act, a sound recording is not technically in the definition of what is called a work for hire. Um, so there's a lot of questions about who really owns a sound recording. And the industry has taken this position, well, it's the record label because we do all these assignments, yada, yada, cover it all up, but who really does own it? So that's another issue that does underlie that. And, and I think, um, you know, underneath this sort of opacity or this lack of, uh, or the 50-page contract that Tommy talked about, is I think a lack of a desire to pay people. You know, the labels just don't want to pay people. <laughs> You know, and even like James Taylor, like he won his big lawsuit, and the label says, okay, well, we know we owe you 1.7 million. We'll pay you 800,000. 800, as, as, a, as a label, I'll, I'll object. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying all labels, yeah, right? Okay, yeah, just, yeah. I'm painting with a broad brush, I, I, yeah. I admit. But uh, James Taylor was, according to a, a, a court uh, judgment, entitled to 1.7 million. They said, well, we'll give you 800,000 right now. And if you don't want to take that right now, then let's keep suing each other, and we'll take a long time. So and even even though you know it's not it's on appeal, but there is this. I just don't want to, you know, I don't want to part with that check. I, I mean, I, and just to say something in defense of the labels, I think part of the problem is that historically the way that that business de developed was, you had the labels doing 
Think of it in terms of manufacturing. They were putting all the pieces together and they were delivering one completed CD or cassette tape or whatever it is with all the rights cleared to the distributors. Um, and so the incentives weren't necessarily there to make sure that everything was sort of completely buttoned up and that every single piece of content was you know, clearly identified and attributed to the, the contributors um, as long as you got the product to the market, right? And then you sold and you sort of figure it out afterwards. Um, as that industry developed, you now have services that are stepping in and trying to cobble together all of that clearance process because we are now, we are now the manufacturers. We are now the ones that are putting together the composition piece and the, and the sound recording piece and going around globally and getting those rights and making them you know, sort of all fit together. So I think part of it is, you know, I, I'm not saying that there isn't certainly a, you know, a, some of what you're, you're saying, but I think some of it is also just the way the sort of industry developed. So. Fair enough. And just so people understand, um, it's an old saw in the law, which is you're wondering why could you have a $1.7 million judgment and you're offered 800000 to walk away after you've won, is the answer is a judgment is just a hunting license. Now you have to go get that money. Um, and that in and of itself is a specialty. And, and quite often what will happen is there's, you have one appeal by right, and, who, and the loser will say, if you don't want to have to go through the trouble of appealing this to get any money, you'll take you know reduction to present value. This is, um, you know, this is what happens. That's the way that game is played. And it's one of the reasons why we need to deal with these upfront transparency problems, because there are a lot, e as hard as this is, it's a, lot, it's a lot easier than if you're the one that's holding the judgment and have no way of collecting. And, and one thing that's contributing to why, why, what makes it so hard for some labels who've been around for a long time to, to take steps towards transparency is that the older agreements don't talk about a lot of what exists now rights-wise. Um, there's no, a lot of the older agreements don't have language that foresaw, you know, a digital performance right in the United States that paid something to master owners. And so, in a lot of ways, I think the, the bigger companies, you know, they're, they're wanting to keep things ambiguous and, and opaque because they, they don't want to have uh, what their older agreements exactly are collapsed to something because it might not be in their interest to do so. I wanted to observe quickly that this is not just about music that in order to fully exploit a musical work, you probably need access to the graphics and photographs that are involved, and the video and the text that may be on the album cover, that exploiting works increasingly is a multimedia exercise for anyone, including the record company itself. And so, in a very real way, we need these things to attain to other industries as well, and some of them are even worse off than we are. I'm not sure if it's better or worse not to have a GUID at all. So for example, photographs and graphic works have no GUID at all. There is not an ISRC, and ISWC equivalent. There's not an easy way to even communicate about these works other than the picture of the girl with the red dress taken apparently well, on the stage. Well, but you can embed metadata through basically any Adobe product just through a click. Yeah. Yes, but, but in the same way he was but talking But there's about another that. warning, and that is that those who believe or who work seriously on identity management, mm -hmm. and I count people like Paul Jessup or Mark Isherwood as some of the very best in this field in the world, mm -hmm. they warn us against embedding things. Mm -hmm. And they say that because, and I think they're right about this, that that which can be embedded into an open format product can easily be, be changed. stripped out, yeah. Right, and so we could very easily see people taking advantage of artists by inserting their own information into those very same files using those very same products and leaving us more astray. So why is that different from IMDB in your mind? Oh, uh, I, I think that when we build a more or less centralized system that we can control, that we can look carefully at and say, okay, that's clearly not right, this clearly isn't wrong. In other words, like the domain naming system, because again, this is what I keep getting brought back to, is that for computers, registration is not a problem. It's a solved problem. In other words, we have a very robust international system that is very, very profitable too, and incentivizes many people to engage in advertising and outreach to make others aware of how to register and what their rights are. And that where we have that kind of thing, things go quite well. So the answer is transparency is the solution to the transparency problem? No. Because it, people it, are actually it, looking at it and complying as no, opposed it, to it's not privately embedding it. What, I, what I'm mm -hmm. arguing for is that transparency often comes from an open market, from a free and open market. And here I will draw an analogy. When I was a teenager, I would go to the Chicago Commodities Exchange and watch open outcry. In other words, these reports were resulted in the, or the reports 
were printed in the evening newspaper. There was a kind of openness about what putting natural gas into a pipeline or selling a steer at market or selling uh, corn three years down the road is going to cost, and that enabled businesses to know what their cost would be three years hence, et cetera. The openness of that system, I think, is attractive. We are in an industry, folks, where almost every deal has an MFN clause, mm -hmm. which means that everyone is engaged in collective licensing all the time. Most favored nation, for yes. those of you trying to decode this at home. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. It's acronym city here today with ISRC and, and MFN and so forth. But if we are in an and industry... pretty soon we're all SOL. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, <it's>, uh, <laughs> you know, here's the beautiful thing about that, is that I don't think we're SOL ever. I think what's beautiful about our industry is this long tradition of actuarial licensing. That back in the 1920s when electricity came and we started to play music in restaurants and radio stations and we started to see music have a life of its own, that we figured out a system that could put a pool of money together and have a relatively fair way of splitting it up. And that's all we're talking about here is keeping that modern, keeping that 2014, making it such that the money that goes into those pools comes out of those pools in rough proportion to how they got in. And so I think we have solutions for anarchy, for monetizing anarchy. We're very, very good at it in some ways. But we lack this one component of identity management. And we can get there. We can. It's not that difficult. Jim, who do you think is uh, working the hardest against what you, what you want? Well, I'll say this. Look, I don't think that those who benefit from it are working as hard as we might think against it. I think they're conflicted. They're dead weight. They well, just go dead weight. And I, I don't know. I just mean, answer I, the question. Too. I'm not going to call. Them, <laughs> I'm not going to call them dead weight straight up because they're financing recording sessions and they're putting music out and everybody wants to deal with them in this way. I, they mean they go dead weight. Yeah. Well, well, no. What I'll say about it is, is that they're ambivalent about funding the solution that hurts them. Mm, right. I think they are okay with it happening as long as they can participate and they can be a, a, an equal partner in making these numbers come off correctly. I think it can work. I I think it has to come together in that way, though. Okay, since you won't answer to No, no, I will. <laughs> the point, Tommy, is this, is that I don't think we should sit back and necessarily point fingers at them saying, why don't you solve the problem that you benefit from? I think it's better for us to come up with alternate solutions, like to get, find ways to allow creators to register their works when they create them instead of waiting for other people to give them duplicative numbers down the line. So you're getting into the solution issue here, but I think you have to understand the problem better, okay? We are leaving a unit sales business and moving to an access model. So it means we're going to a pot sharing model, which is what publishing has had for a long time. But in the music business, it's always been, we sell X units, you get X amount, after returns, deductions, and all that. But everything was tied to a sale of, an, of a unit. The music industry was built around a control model based around that. In the new world of the internet and internet economics and attention economics, it's a rev share model. It's based on sharing. This is a, a concept that is totally foreign to the traditional labels. Their business is a control business. This new business that the entire internet is based on, including Google's business, is rev share. Got you know, it. Disagree. We, with everybody. we had radio long before we sold sound recordings, Tommy. Radio came in the 1920s. We what sold sound recordings starting about? in the 1950s. And, no, and labels never got paid in either. In the United sport. States, it didn't uh, you know, make what, a penny what, for the recorded side. Right. We don't get paid, as you know, for, for radio. In, you, know, you know, the point is, we're not used to that. You have to agree, the, major, the way the major labels think, and I'm on all the boards, so I know them all, they're still thinking the way it was in the 80s. It's all about album sales and sales. How do we get track equivalent albums? How do we get stream equivalent albums? It's 1,500 streams that equals an album now. Let's still keep our album hat on because we're still trying to convert the future into the way we thought about the business in the past. Instead of thinking about the business as an attention, an attention business and how do we maximize the ARPU and monthly average users and maximize the amount of revenue and split that revenue in some way it benefits all of us, but even if we're the owners, they're going to say this is what we need to split. Moving to a sharing mentality changes the game. So they have, are, are, they're fighting for leverage. They have it's scale changing. advantages. They, have deal, they make deals that smaller people can't deal. They have a big incentive in keeping small companies small to keeping artists unorganized. Because the less organized the artist community is, 
the more scale advantage they have. They would love that the only distribution to, is to be theirs. Look at the growth of aggregation businesses. TuneCore, CD Baby, The Orchard, and so many other digital aggregators have risen up in this area organizing that chaos out there, but basically taking rights that people didn't see as having value and creating a value by putting it together and then taking their share and they've created a new middle person in that process and, you know, wh where is this all going? We have to move to an attention economy and a different way to look at it. But we're not going to get there if we can't track where these things are going. The fact that you're saying we're moving to aggregation in, in all these different ways is great, but it's still at some point you have to be able to say who's participating where and how. Sure, but in, in, take it to, to touch on what Tom is touching about, um, take Spotify as a service out there in the marketplace. You know, right now they have a fixed revenue pie that they're going to share, whether it's coming from subscriptions or ad revenue that they generate. And they have agreements with, with labels and, and maybe directly with some artists that say, hey, if we stream your content, we're going to pay you this percentage or, or this minimum streaming rate. This is different than how music used to be sold or is still being sold, but it seems like it's not being sold this way as much. When you bought a CD, if, if you raise the price on your CD, it had no effect on someone else's CD sale. In this new marketplace, where it's a fixed revenue pie, if one you know, rights holder is getting paid more than another rights holder, um, you know, or if, if, if one rights holder can get another dollar for themselves, it has to come from the other rights holders. It's a zero-sum game. It's a zero-sum game. I think I'm, I'm giving the... Um, Which makes track we have to end this. Uh, can we have any questions at all, or is there no time for questions? I'm getting the shake head, no time for questions. You just have to corral the folks on the panel um, afterwards, but thank you very much for an awesome job. Thank you.